No. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, as usual, as always, thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's for me just recreation to be here, as I always say. But I have to say it every year. It's just in getting back away from all of the management and all of this stuff and pure science and excitement. And uh, last year, as usual, um, something happened. Uh, someone came up with uh, and asked me a question. And uh, that triggered some interaction. It was Duncan. And uh, you know how it is in Santa Cruz. I get a month of ideas, and it takes me 11 months to work them out. I come back next year, and I get another month of new ideas. And so Duncan came to me and said, Andy, uh, have you ever seen this? And I said, well, I remember barely. It is a global class. They said, yes, you got it right. <laughs> and uh, then he said, isn't this a beautiful object? And I said, yes, it definitely is. It's so spherically symmetric, uh, sitting there for uh, as long as the universe exists. And uh, But the problem with this is because it is relaxed and two-body relaxation has removed all the information of how it formed all this irregularity and mess, it's very hard to figure out how it formed. And that's what I, when I got interested, I said, well, you don't really know how it formed, no, Duncan? Uh, maybe, is he, are you here, Duncan? He's not. Oh, at the airport. At the airport, perfect, okay. <laughs> so I can say all kinds of things. So we said, okay, <laughs> let's work a little bit on this and work it out. Well, you know, these globulars are very old, 10 to 12 giga years, so they formed at the time where the Milky Way wasn't around. Must have been lots of bits and pieces. And somehow in these bits and pieces of galaxies, these global clusters form. They have masses of 10 to 5 solar masses. And that is exciting because if you look at the mass function of molecular clouds, it's completely different. It's a power law that goes as m to the minus 2. And out of this power law, you get this kind of characteristic mass, which might mean that maybe it's an erosion. It's like Monument Valley, and all of these things have been eroded, and you see just the most massive part. Or maybe there's something special about global cluster formation that only the highest mass tail of the molecular clouds make a global cluster. We actually don't yet know. The radii of the clusters are of order 10 parsecs, and that's again interesting. It's of the same order as a molecular cloud, but a little too small. And if you then from that work out the mean density of the gas that formed the globular, it is 10 to the 4 particles per cubic centimeter. It's a factor 100 denser than in the typical molecular cloud. And that explains how they form. Simply because if you look at the free fall time at 10 to 4, it's 5, 10 to 5 years. And that is so short that no feedback can ever affect the cloud. It's far shorter than anything. And if you look at the normal molecular cloud, the mean density is more like 100. The free fall time is in 5 to the 6, as we all know. That's the typical age of a molecular cloud. And then you get lots of feedback, and you get a very small star formation efficiency. But in this case, it's impossible. So the cloud cannot do anything else but collapse and turn with high efficiency into stars. So forming a globular, once you have the cloud, is not the problem. The problem is getting the cloud in the first place. Because you know, if a parcel of one solar mass can collapse, uh, on such a short time scale, then why should it wait till about in the six solar masses of material have accumulated and then start collapsing? That requires that you form this cloud of 10 to 6 solar masses on that short a time scale. And that is tough. And I think nobody ever has worked it out. There's a paper by Howard et al. published in Nature where they claim they have gotten global clusters a global cluster, but they think they put it in. Because they started with a 10 to 6 solar mass cloud at these densities of 10 to the 4. They said they don't need feedback. Yes, I know, because it collapses too fast. It collapsed and formed a global cluster. Well, he put, they put it in. What else can this poor cloud do than collapse and form a global cluster? <laughs> well, it was published in Nature. OK, that explains <laughs> it. Um, and so this is not necessarily the right solution. OK, so globular clusters are not alone. They are part of galaxies. And because of that, uh, they also tell us a lot about galaxy evolution. And uh, I just want to mention one aspect, uh, which is very, very um, fascinating. There's a blue and a red sequence of global clusters. The blue sequence uh, starts uh, between, uh, is between minus 2.5 and minus 1 in F of H. And the red sequence is the metal-rich 
component. And you see, if you look at the height above the disk, this is of the Milky Way in an old thin paper, which I still love. Uh, you see the blue component reaches heights up to 20 kiloparsecs. That's clearly a halo component, while the red component is confined to the thick disk or bulge or whatever. So we say this is ex situ or accreted, and this is in situ and probably formed within this kind of galaxy. And you see this kind of two components, and this is a beautiful paper by Jean and her collaborators, uh, in all types of galaxies as a function of their ma the mass. Uh, um, there's a red component, there's a blue component, there's always the, g the same gap, it's kind of it's really symmetric. And you see that the mean value of the metal list increases when you go to more massive galaxies, which I think is an in, in, uh, another interesting effect. And you see actually when you look at the fraction of blue to red, the deflection increases when you go to lower masses and when you go into the dwarf regime then you have no red component anymore you just have the blue component well this is again reasonable because you get here into a regime where the galaxy cannot get to metallistis above minus one and if the red component requires metallistis above minus one this galaxy can't form it anymore so that's basically uh, what we see now one of the things you will probably do first when you realize global clusters exist is to look at the specific frequency. It just means the fraction of stars you have in the global cluster system compared to the mass of the, all the, the stars in the galaxy. Which fraction is actually bound in the global cluster? This is normalized to the Milky Way, so if you have something like 10, then in this galaxy there are 10 times more stars and globalers with respect to the galaxy mass than in the Milky Way. And here you see the specific frequency as, galaxy, as function of galaxy mass, and this has been discussed earlier. You see it's of order one when you go to the Milky Way regime, but when you go to the massive galaxies, it's actually going up. There's much more stars and globalists compared to the background. Uh, and when you go to small galaxies, it's again going up. So it's this kind of valley which you see over there. And this is telling us that just at L star, uh, the galaxy is most efficient in forming field stars with respect to global cluster stars. And, you know, this is exactly the same thing if you look at the Moster et al. Um, mass fraction of galaxies. Here we now plot stellar masses where there's real mass. And you go at the same mass, galaxies are most efficient in forming stars in the galaxy compared to the dark matter mass. And you see this is the same thing. Here we have M star over MV. And here we have uh, um, uh, M star over M globular cluster. <laughs> and you see it has the same shape. And because it has the same shape, you can do a very simple calculation. M star over M global cluster is proportional to M star over M here. Yeah. Even this I can work out. And the <laughs> outcomes M globular cluster is proportional to M here. What else can it be? And so that tells us that the global cluster mass of the global cluster system doesn't trace the stellar mass in the galaxy traces the real dark matter mass of this galaxy and there's something that has been worked out by Bill Harris and his collaborator Hudson et al. Uh, a long time ago. So this is the motivation uh, for what we wanted to do. Uh, okay, uh, I'll do it again. Uh, but then we thought about something different. This was mass of stars in global clusters. And the mass of a stellar component is hard to determine. It depends on mass to light ratio. Uh, the mass of a global cluster changes because it loses gas and it loses stars. So it's a time dependent variable and hard to determine. So we said, why not looking at the number of global clusters where the severe mass of a galaxy? That is maybe more stable. It's much easier to get. You just simply count. And you do not necessarily have to count all the globals. You just count the globals above the peak in the luminosity, in, 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 the, in the mass function, and then multiply by two, then you get it. So if you miss some low mass globals, it doesn't really matter. And so that is what we did, and uh, we took Duncan's sample, and then just log plotted log n global clusters versus log mv, and we found this correlation. And so these points are now the observations of giant ellipticals, here are the galaxy clusters, and here are the dwarf galaxies. And you see this really beautiful correlation between the number of globulars and the real mass, which is very simple. Um, um, you have five to the nine solar masses of dark matter for each globular cluster in the galaxy. And from that, you can easily work out how much real mass 
you have if you given the number of globular clusters. Now, you might argue, okay, these are ellipticals, but what happens if we add spiral galaxies? So we took the spirals where we had a handle on and they lie, have the same problem as before, they lie precisely on the correlation. So independent of galaxy morphology, you get this kind of beautiful correlation. And it's really nice because it allows you to precisely predict real masses. Um, now, one of the tests was Dragonfly 44. We had been discussing this before. This galaxy is extreme. It has a small stellar mass of only 3108 solar masses. And if you work out from this typical specific frequency of globulars, it should have one globular cluster. But uh, observed are 74 globulars. So does that now violate our correlation? So we put Dragonfly on it and it lies precisely there where it should lie. It tells us that the real mass, which had been determined from the kinematics, you had heard this before, um, is actually probably right, and it fits right on this correlation, which tells you that you can even lose these UDGs to work out with high precision what the real mass is if by just counting uh, their global clusters. Now you might wonder about this regime here. Here are the dwarfs, and you see they seem to fall off this kind of correlation. Well, this is exactly what you would expect because here you reach one globular uh, in a galaxy. And of course, you can't see these uh, galaxies over there that have no globulars. If I would put them on, they, at log n would be minus infinity, and I couldn't put minus infinity on. So you only see those galaxies, which dwarf galaxies, which do have a globular cluster. They exist, and, but they can only Ex globals can only exist there statistically. You know, if you have one global cluster per five to nine solar masses of dark matter, then you need five dwarf galaxies with a dark matter halo of one so ten to nine solar mass to see one global cluster. And that's precisely if you do this correction, then you get this leveling off. You're now just showing only the dwarfs that have global clusters and fits very nicely the correlation. So we argue that this correlation statistically ranges from 10 to, 10 to 8 all the way to 10 to 16, eight orders of magnitudes of precise determination of real masses just by measuring and counting uh, the globular clusters. Now, th the question is, um, why is that so? And uh, there's a very simple answer. People discussed it and said the central limit theorem has nothing to do with central limit theorem. Central limit theorem is just simply hierarchical merging. And that's because of the following uh, way. You know, you have a population of seed uh, galaxies with a real mass MV and a number of global clusters uh, of any kind, randomly distributed. And then you have K mergers. Then MV after that is K times the mean value of MV of your initial population. And N is K times the mean number of globulars of your initial population. And of course, you can write that, that the number of globulars at the end is the mean value ratio times MV. You see, immediately you get this kind of linear correlation. You just put the things together and out has to come a linear correlation and you can easily test that. You know, if we started here with a seed population of globulars randomly distributed uh, within uh, this range of real masses and then let it evolve and out comes this linear correlation for free. Uh, what else can it do? Now, when you look, uh, actually, no, before I do this, uh, let me show you I don't know, I go direct to this. Now, when you look at this correlation, at this kind of points, which are these, the simulation of this very simple Monte Carlo study, you see that the spread becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And you see also the spread of the, globe, of the observations declines a little bit, but not as much as you would predict from this kind of hierarchy emerging. And you can basically work out how the scatter should decrease with increasing real masses, and that is now the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that in a random merging, the scatter you get is proportional to the square root of the number. And so delta n over n should go as 1 over square root of n. And as n is proportional to mv, it goes as 1 over uh, square root of mv. And this is here now log delta n over n versus log mv. And this is what we find in our Monte Carlo study is precisely what you see. So you see, actually, if this is correct, then when you go to masses of 10 to 12 and 10 to 13, the uncertainty in determining the virial mass 
from the number of globular clusters becomes tiny because of this kind of central limit theorem. And if we can actually work it out uh, for real masses of 10 to 12 or more, the uncertainty in determining the real mass is 0.1 dex. This is no other method can give you this uncertainty, uh, th this precisely the real masses compared to that. But the observations, oh no, I just want to show you two examples. One is the Milky Way, I say 155 globulars. So its real mass must be level 0.9 plus minus 0.1 could be 10 to 12, but couldn't be much more than 10 to 12. And Andromeda has 420, real mass 12.3, so it must be two times more massive than the Milky Way. It just comes out from that, you don't have to do complex, uh, whatever, uh, dynamical studies with anisotropies and uh, uh, weak lensing and, and what to do, I know, I don't know. So it's basically as simple as that. Now the problem is, if you look at the observations, and here you see this cat as function of MV, it does not decrease as fast as the observations. And we actually now added um, an uncertainty in determining real masses. We said you don't really know from observations very well how the real masses are. Suppose you have an uncertainty in determining real masses of factor two. Where do you lie? And then you lie exactly along this line. This is an uncertainty um, uh, 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 of 10% and so on. So basically, you can show when you determine real masses uh, with an error of order 2, you can reproduce the observations. And that tells us, at the moment, we don't know real masses to better than a factor 2. But with the number of global loss, you can get it better. That's what I claim, than a factor of 2. OK. so. How do these globulars now form and how do you get this kind of correlation in the real cosmological simulation, not this kind of Monte Carlo study? And you know, you need to look at one. We have our own magneticum, uh, just advertising it a little bit, but there are many others and they could all do it, I think, if they ever get it right. Um, and uh, okay, so there have been studies and Mike Boy and Kolchin, who gave a talk actually here a couple of years ago, actually had the following idea. He said, Okay, we do cosmological merging and we form the global clusters at redshift six. That's roughly the age where they should form. And uh, we just don't form them in all halos. We have it at, at redshift six. We just form them in halos with masses larger than 10 to the nine solar masses. And then we put the, a, a number n of globals into this, which is given by the real mass it has divided by this minimum mass of 10 to nine solar masses. So a 10 to 10 solar mass dark halo has 10 globulars at redshift 6. So that's what he put in. And um, now what, you would, what would you predict? What would you expect from our correlation? You know, if you just look at the blue globulars, and he was talking about the blue globulars, then we need a real mass of 10 to 10 solar mass per globular cluster. Because we only look at 50% of all the globulars. No, it's not 5 to the 9, it's 10 to the 10. And you might say, but this doesn't fit to this minimum mass of 10 to the 9, where he put the globulars in. And the answer is very simple. If you look at the mass function of uh, progenitors of your halo, then you figure out that at 10 to the 9, if you put your limit here, and you fill these halos with your global clusters, you have 90% of halos that have no global cluster. And these 90% merges with this kind of halos that have globular clusters, and that gives you the factor 10 in additional real dark matter mass, uh, which you need in order to go to 10 to the 10. So that's basic, and that works out for all uh, progenitors, so to say, for all masses, and it only breaks down when you go to low masses. And you can put this kind of model in, and you can work it out, and then you see, you get this kind of result. It fits very nicely, but then at low mass, it doesn't fit at all. And he would predict there are no galaxies which have global clusters below uh, a few, uh, almost 10 to the 10 solar masses, so it doesn't really work properly. And there are other problems. Uh, um, first of all, um, how did the globulars above 10 to the 9 solar mass get there? Uh, the, the, the halos above 10 to the 9 solar mass get their globulars? Somebody puts the solution in. Now, these 10 to 11 solar mass halos have already 10, 100 globulars. So, how did they form in these redshift 6 halos in the first place? So, he hasn't really solved it. He just played a little bit with the numbers. Why should it be 10 to 9 and what determines this? And uh, what's about the global clusters in the dwarf galaxies, which he cannot explain. So I think this model has some caveats. Uh, and it, 
it doesn't explain the red sequence at all. You know, why should the red, you know, this thing here is the sum of the blue and the red sequence. If you take the blue sequence and if you take into account that the blue fraction depends on real mass, it doesn't work anymore. It only works for the combination. But how does the red sequence know how many blue clusters already formed so that it can actually gets it right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'm, on, I'm out of uh, time, but I know I don't get chocolate anyway, isn't it? Well, okay, then I can go on. Uh, like uh, Avishai was starting this. Uh, I know. So I felt I'm done in, 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 a few, in a few seconds anyway. So, so we thought of a different model. Um, our model uh, was different. We just said we always form global clusters. Any time in the universe, whenever a dark halo reaches a mass of 10 to 8 solar masses. So we have a big merger tree. We let dark halos grow. And whenever this dark halo reaches 10 to 8 solar mass, we form one global unit. Don't ask me how uh, it happens. <laughs> and I know in the universe it happened too. So, so let's it happen. And then what do you get? You know, you get this kind of distribution um, uh, of the number of globals where there's real mass. And these red points are the observations. It works very nicely. It also fills the dwarf regime. So it is uh, working nicely. If you look at the scatter, you see the scatter decreases exactly as we would predict from the simple Monte Carlo simulation, which indeed shows that what we see out here must be um, an observational problem still, if this model is right. And if you look at the redshift distribution, the H distribution of the globalist, you see it peaks at roughly 10, 12 gig years ago, because most dark halos had 28 solar masses roughly at the time. So that works. You get a tail uh, of young globalists. If you then look at uh, the mass of the real mass of the, of the halo today, you see uh, in small halos, the globular should be on average longer than in the big halos. These are things uh, we might have to work out, but we can't completely understand why there should be red, why there should be blue, why it should be a 10 to the 8, and always in 10 to the 8. So my summary is very quick and easy. And I have to say, Duncan, I'm sorry we need to continue for another year. Uh, global clusters are still a mystery. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. So if you want me to buy that globulars are the best predictor of halo mass, you not only have to argue that there's sort of a self-similarity information, but also the survivability to redshift zero. And we know from the Milky Way that a lot of globulars don't survive. So have you thought about how that would yes. put a wrinkle in this whole perspective? Yes, it's a very good point. And if the, survive, if the disruption rate is independent of real mass, it wouldn't change anything. It would just shift the zero point, and so the linear relation would be, and then we would just say it's another real mass, which is per global cluster. You know, that is easy. If you make it dependent on real mass, and it, it surprisingly doesn't make any difference. So we did one simulation where we destroyed the global cluster system completely when a galaxy crossed 10 to 12 solar masses in real mass. So the galaxies were growing when they reached in the 12 solar masses. We erased the global cluster system, but the galaxy begins to accrete and merge with other galaxies and gains a new global cluster system because the other galaxies with lower masses still have their globulars. And it turns out, at the end, it's the same correlation. You see a little bit of, of a tail of galaxies. Um, uh, do I have this here? Oh, no, I don't have it here. Sorry. I'm sorry. But, um, a little tail of galaxies that miss global clusters at 10 to 12 solar masses, but you go to 2 10 to 12 solar mass already erased. So here are the merging erases these kind of sudden events very, very quickly. That's a good part. So it's, yeah, it's really, really robust. It only would make a difference if you systematically erase global clusters as function of real mass. If the galaxy know what the real mass is and then you always Yes, it might increase the scatter, but also not very much. The scatter was again going down roughly at 1 over, one over mv, a, a, a little, little different uh, in, in the zero point, but again was going down as 1 over mv. It didn't much make much difference. If you find a, a disruption method model that leads the scatter high, leads to high scatter and still preserves the linear correlation, uh, please send me an email immediately. Well, it's published in nature. Okay, one more quick question with quick answer. Uh, so in a recent paper, Bruce Almagreen argued yeah. that the globulars are the low mass end of the same sequence that includes these clumps that Yi Ching Guo talked about. That yeah. doesn't fit your picture, I think. Uh, what do you think yeah, of that? Yeah, I mean, um, 
Yeah, the reason good, is that, that you yes. have to, in order to make such massive clumps, you have to be in a bigger galaxy. Yeah, that is true. That <coughs> might lead to bias, which would destroy this kind of linear correlation. So we might then rule out that this picture is right. Right. Have you thought about uh, no, the other that points? No, that's very good. That's why I'm here. Yeah. yeah. And so another year to work with. Us. I agree with you. That's a very good point. I never thought about that. When was it published? Uh, it was on the archive a few months ago. A few months ago, and I didn't see. Yeah. Uh, late, late to 2018. I 2018, oh, this is already a year ago. No, 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 I mean, it probably was just published. Anyway, it's the latest paper by Jennifer. Great, I will look at Bruce it. Thank you very much. Great, great. Okay, let's thank Andy <laughs> one more time.